Welcome to Light Shining in Darkness. Then the truth will set you free. You will hear experiences of God's love and guidance. May you be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen. Welcome back to the show. We're glad to have you here today. Glad to see Eric here. and Good to be here, Otto. I'm Otto Morgan and Eric Wilson. We are glad to have you and we still want your feedback. So write us or call us. It's 828-692-1190 or email us at wfhcfm at gmail.com. And also I want to just take a minute. If you want a copy of this little book, Light Shining in Darkness, Prelude to the Dragon Revealed, just call or write and let us know and we'll send you one. Yes. So we're going to get right back into the topic of standing at the crossroads. So Eric, let's jump right back in. Okay. Let's open with a scripture. We were looking in Romans chapter six on our last show, and we're going to go back there. Romans chapter six, and we're going to look at verse 20 through 22. And this is important. Read Romans 6, like if you read the first 10 or 11 verses, it tells us that we died when Jesus died, that we were raised when he was raised, and that we were raised not to continue in our old lives, but to walk in newness of life. And praise God, I know you know what that's like, and I know what that's like. It's like, it changes everything. I'm trying every day, so I don't think it happens overnight for sure, but... (laughs) Well, you know what? It's funny because it tells us in Romans 6, verse 10 and 11, and this took me a while to grasp. It's not that God doesn't do it instantly. It's like it takes us a while for him to, our minds have been so corrupted by the world and by Satan and by sin that God has to put everything back in its right place so that we can understand. It says in Romans 6, verse 10, speaking of Jesus, In that he died, he died unto sin. It wasn't that he just died to pay the penalty that we owe. He had our sins in his own flesh, and he chose to die rather than yield to your sins and my sins and everyone that's in our listening audience. It was personal, our personal sins. He said, I choose to die rather than yield to Eric's sin or Otto's sin or John or Sue. I choose to die. And then in verse 11, listen to what it says. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King. So that literally is telling me if I died when he died, and he died unto sin, I died unto sin. Reckon ye also therefore yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. A living man can sin. A dead man has no desire for evil. He's dead. Do you know what I mean? The dead know not anything. Praise the Lord. Let's go on from there. Look at verse 20. Romans chapter 6 verse 20. It's speaking to you and I in past tense. He's speaking to us being on this side of the resurrection of Calvary. And put your name in there. It says, for when you, Eric or Otto or Mary or John or Susan, when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. And I thought about that. It made me laugh because I thought, I was a wicked, heathen person from the time I was 14 years old until I was 22. I mean, I was wicked. Went to ACDC concerts and, you know, played the field when it came to, you know, my relationships. And I did everything you could do wrong. I didn't have any problem with doing righteousness. If somebody had come to me and said, hey, I want you to do righteousness, I'd been like, I'm not going to touch righteousness. It was not even a strain for me to resist righteousness. The Apostle Paul writes to us and says, when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you now are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And then he says in verse 22, but now, 
Eric and Otto and, and whatever your name is. But now, being made free from sin, you have become servants to God. And now you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end of that is everlasting life. In other words, wow. Paul said, when you were living for the devil, you didn't have any trouble resisting righteousness. So why not live for God and have no trouble resisting the sins of the flesh? It tells us right there in Romans six fourteen, sin does not have dominion over us anymore. And what I found in my life is I have to claim that every moment of every day. Lord, you have written your law and your word in my heart. Sin does not have dominion over me. That means I'm not under that ownership anymore. That's like somebody can't come and tell you what to do. It'd be like some, some guy coming and telling you how to paint your car or how to eat your food. Nobody can tell you what to do. You're a grown man. Right. The only one that you serve and I serve is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't have to listen to the enemy anymore. We just say, sin doesn't have dominion over me. But we still have that choice. We have to make that choice. Amen. Every day. Make Amen. That and that's why he told, told us in Joshua, I think it was Joshua, maybe chapter 24. I don't remember the exact verse, but he said, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Choose you. We're at the crossroads. Every moment and every day, those crossroads are presented. Do I want to choose God or do I want to choose another? If I'm playing for you know the team in Hendersonville and they're my team and another team comes from South Carolina, I wouldn't be wearing their jersey. If I'm from Hendersonville, North Carolina, I'm not wearing the jersey for the team in South Carolina. <laughs> so if I'm a Christian, why am I wearing the devil's jersey? Am I, if I'm a Christian, why am I listening to his music? If I'm a Christian, why am I watching his TV shows? Good point. If I'm a Christian, why am I eating his food? God is telling us, I've made you free. Walk like it. Believe my word. Great stuff. Now, I want to go back on something that you brought up right towards the end of the show. You were talking about, about music and about the rhythms and, and the syncopated beats and I, I remember something that Pastor Ivor Myers brought out that really hit me. He said, that four-count rhythm, that rhythm is the devil's signature. When you hear that rhythm, Ivor Myers said, I don't even have to hear what the words say. I could care less what the words say. If I hear the devil's rhythm, I know who authored that song, regardless of the words. Satan doesn't care if you say Jesus and have Jesus written on your T-shirt. If you're living like him, if you're living like the devil, he doesn't care what you say you believe. He cares what you live, how you walk. So the idea of the music actually affecting us, and we talked about Mickey Hart, you know, the drummer for the Grateful Dead, I believe is the, the band he was for. He talked about the drums. Carlos Santana, you remember him? Oh, yeah. He talked about the drums. He even wrote about them. He said, the drums is what came from Africa. The drums were not, you cannot find drums anywhere in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the Old Testament are drums mentioned. You have a tambourine, but the tambourine is completely different than a drum. Yes, it's a, a percussion instrument. You can make a rhythm with it, but its design was completely different, and the effect it has on the human mind and psyche is completely different. The drums were always used to channel evil spirits in Africa at time of war or when there was spiritual rituals. From Africa, that was taken to Jamaica and to some of the islands with voodoo. All of the voodoo came from Africa and the music came because that was the rhythm that they used in those rituals to channel the spirits. Well, the blues and jazz came from those same rituals. That rhythm they found got inside of human beings. It got inside of their psyche. And it, let me think how to put this. It makes a person more ready to yield 
to sensual desires. Even if the words are about Jesus, if it makes you want to dance, it's not going to be a good thing. Yeah. That's where I like Christian Bardal's videos about that because he'll play those yes that music and then he'll ask people what they thought it was and one of the first seven songs he put on there he had them answer whether christian or secular and every one of them were christian and i think most people put down that they were secular songs because the sound the of sound the music, and the beat yeah. that's right that's right yeah. and you know it's funny because a lot of people nowadays and i was this way when i first came back to christ after the lord brought me out of you know, my, my backsliding, I don't condemn people that are listening to that contemporary Christian music, you know, because of the beat. I don't condemn them, but I do want them to realize there's more there than what they know. I was there, but after the Lord started revealing this stuff to me, I was like, I don't want that anymore. I can be inspired. I can have chills run up my, mm -hmm. you know, the back of my neck, listening to a hymn that is sung with power and with feeling. I don't think that Christian music is supposed to be dry and feelingless. If a music is, if it's dry and it doesn't invoke emotions, it shouldn't be a song. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just talk, but singing is supposed to come from the heart. Right. But when you look at the music, if it is invoking physical response, normally that's not what you want. You said you'd seen ACDC. I saw them when I came home from the naval base for a weekend to see them in Charlotte, North Carolina, and probably about 1979. And then they came out there and they said that that song, Highway to Hell. Yeah, I remember he that. He yelled that out. He said, do you want to go to hell? And everybody screamed, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, I don't want to go to hell. I know. I mean, what am I listening to this? Crazy mess. And boy. you know, they were using ACDC music in Iron Man movies and a lot of the, the other popular movies. I, I mean, think our president plays some of that at his rally, yes. some of his music. Yes, and that's terrifying. Yeah. Let me go back. Let's go back just a little bit because I want to touch on something. There was a quote here I wanted to share. This was a quote from Jimi Hendrix, and it was in Life magazine, 1969. That's the year I was born. Listen to what Jimi Hendrix said. He said, I can explain everything better through music. We hypnotize people. And when you can get them at their weakest point, you can preach into their subconscious what we want to say. Wow, I never knew he said that. I mean, like literally, he wow. said, I, through the rhythms, we get people. That's why people will go to a nightclub and they've got flashing lights, a dark room, and rhythm. And all of a sudden there's girls that are uh, losing their virginity. Their inhibitions are taken away. You've got young men that are doing the same thing. Throw a little alcohol in and it just... Okay. You've got witchcraft there. That's yeah. exactly what they would do in voodoo and in Africa, in the pagan rituals. You had a dark night, flashing lights, a fire with sparks and figures dancing around it. And you throw a little alcohol in there and you don't stand a chance. I don't know how long you've lived in this area, but in downtown Asheville during the summer months before COVID, they had a drum circle. And people come oh, from wow. people come from around the country. They said, Man, I want to go to that drum circle. Have you ever been? I said, I've been. You know, you take your drum, African drum. And I mean I've got drums and I have an African drum and take lessons and stuff and that, that beat is kinda of, it's kinda of like Doom, doom, taka taka doom. Yeah, it's what you're hitting in there. Taka taka doom, doom doom, taka taka doom. Yeah, hitting that bass and is the, is the doom, and then you have a paw that you kind of hit your hand. But the people love to go to. They, there would be a whole crowd right downtown or in this one area that's kind of a sunken area, and people sitting around. Do you know that they're bringing that drumming into churches now? There are contemporary and emergent churches that are actually bringing the, the practice of what they call spiritual drumming into their worship services because it, it promotes a religion that is sensual, that's physical rather than spiritual as far as heaven. It's amazing stuff. I'm going to give you one more example uh, from our era, 
And just to let our listeners know, if we have younger people out there, like my, my son and my daughter are like, dad, that was the, the old days. Just to let you know, it's not getting any better. If it was bad in the 60s and 70s, you can guarantee it has not progressed to better and more righteousness now in our day. This band is a band I know that most of our listeners are familiar with. They're called the Rolling Stones. I saw them at Clemson University about 1988, somewhere along there. I can't remember. Yeah. You know what was funny? I remember when I used to work for a security company where we installed home security systems. and We were on a construction site. A lot of the buildings, uh, when they're being built, and a lot of the construction workers had, you know, a big, you know, music player there as they're listening to rock and roll all day long. And I found myself, my partner and I would be there, and it was like I'd catch myself tapping my foot or my hand. And I'm, I'm listening. I'm like, they're playing wicked music. I'm a Christian. How come that song is still inside my head? And people say, well, it's in there and you can't get rid of it. But that's not what God's word says. Jesus says, I blot out your iniquities. That means I erase them. So whatever, and I had to ask the Lord. I said, Lord, I want you to go inside my heart and my mind. And with your blood, I want you to blot out and erase all those lyrics, all those songs, all those memories of all the movies I watched I shouldn't have watched. Blot it out. I want it clean, not just forgiven. Funny you talk about it sticking in your head because I used to call on an office years ago in Waynesville, or even in uh, Maggie Valley, too. She worked at two different offices. And that song, I think it was the Doobie Brothers, Old Black Water. Yes. One day I went in there humming that because I just heard it on the radio. And she goes, stop, stop, stop doing that. I said, what? She said, singing that song, Old Black Water, keep on shining. And every time I went in there, I would do that just to bug her. She'd just put her hands over her ears. But anyway. Well, <laughs> What's funny is, is when you, when you look at the Rolling Stones, they had a number of hit songs. I mean, they were very popular, but there was one song in particular that really caught my attention. It was called Sympathy for the Devil. Oh, yeah. Without getting into too much weirdness, there's also a group that many people claim is a Christian rock band. Uh, the group is called U2. You remember them, oh, the yeah. Joshua Tree, yeah. and oh, yeah. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I think they can't be Christian because if you're looking for Christ, he says, I'll be found of you if you search for me. But here U2 says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That's a song that sticks in your head too. I know. Very. But very I just asked the song. Lord, blot it out. Yeah. Let this mind be in me, which was in Christ Jesus. And he didn't have any of those residues of the past. When he woke up from Calvary, the past was gone. The Rolling Stones, Sympathy for the Devil. In this song, I don't want to give you a whole lot. I'm going to share just a couple of the lyrics that they say. They say, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year and stole many a man's soul and faith. I was round when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Christ never had a moment of doubt. He suffered, but he never doubted. Then they say that they made quite sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. Then they say, pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. The name of the song was Sympathy for the Devil. Mm -hmm. Right in your face. This was the devil that inspired these words. I'm going to bring up something that for me was very startling. That documentary I saw by Good Fight Ministries, the Baptist ministry, there was one place on there, I don't remember where in that series on They Sold Their Soul for Rock and Roll, and they kept showing rock and roll stars sticking their tongue out on stage. Like Gene, uh, like, Simmons and like Gene Simmons on Kiss. You know what? Look at the pop singers, the girls that are doing that now. Mm -hmm. You can look at any entertainment periodical or magazine, and you'll see people sticking their tongue out. Miley Cyrus. I hate to even bring her name up, but, <laughs> I mean, we need to pray for these people. They're sticking their tongue out. 
And it's funny because I can remember when I was a little boy, my mother told me, you never stick your tongue out at somebody. And we laugh at that now. I've had people in, in our churches say, oh, it's, it's harmless. I mean, it just means, I, I don't know, it's just harmless. But in my heart, I always knew because my mom had told me, there's something not right about sticking your tongue out. That's right. But you know what's amazing? That's If you ask somebody to put an icon, to draw an icon for the Rolling Stones, that's the number one icon that you'll see portrayed. Yep. An open mouth with the tongue sticking out. And I thought, why would Rolling Stones put that on their album? What, what would make you put that symbol on your album? And guess what? It tells us in God's word. Let me read this verse to you. This is in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 34. The Lord says, Draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, and you children of the whore. For against who do you sport yourselves? Against whom do you make wide your mouth and draw out the tongue? Wow. Wow. Oh, that's a good one. What is that verse again? That's Isaiah 57, verse 34. And listen to how he ends. He says, Are ye not all children of transgression and rebellion and seed of falsehood? When people stick their tongue out, knowingly or unknowingly, that's who's inspiring it to be done. It says, You are children of rebellion the seed of falsehood. The seed of falsehood, Jesus said the devil is a liar and the father of lies. The seed of the devil. That's why Rolling Stone was inspired, whether they know it or not, to put that on their album cover. It's amazing they're still playing. I know. And they're in their late 70s, I'm pretty certain. I know. Maybe older. You know, it's funny because I look at that and they get up on stage and act like they're 20 years old. Yeah. But we as Christians, often, many Christians will act like the devil has more power. Do you know that the Bible says of Moses that when he died, he was, hundred, I think, 120 years old? When he died, it says, his eyes had not dimmed, neither had his natural force, his strength, his fortitude abated. When it speaks about Joshua and Caleb, when they went in after Moses had died to take the land of Canaan, Caleb looked at Joshua and he said, I remember when we were here 40 years ago. 40 years ago, Caleb and Joshua were 40 years old. They were 80 years old when they were going into the land of Canaan. Wow. And Caleb looked at Joshua and he said, Moses promised me that mountain, the one where all the giants are. He said, I am able to go in and to come out just like I was 40 years ago. It means I can go to war. He said, I want the mountain. And Joshua said, it's yours. And Caleb conquered all the giants in that mountain, he and his tribe. It's a great story. If we have God, if God be for us, who can be against us? Let me share something real quick, Otto, because I know we're running out of time. Time goes by so fast. It does go fast. <laughs> We've sort of exposed some of the what people would call hard rock, you know, ACDC and the Rolling Stones and Van Halen and you know, Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton, and you know, those people are like the hard extreme. We could throw in Marilyn Manson for the younger crowd. Yeah, that that's, that's scary. That's a whole other episode. <laughs> that is. That would take a while. But let me share something with you that I found that really shocked me. There is a man that probably my mom and dad listened to, probably your parents. His name was Barry Manilow. And everybody goes, what could be wrong with Barry Manilow? I mean, he was soft. I mean, it was, it was nice music. It wasn't a bunch of this head banging and, and craziness. And it was Barry Manilow. Listen to a song that Barry Manilow was inspired to write. And this is probably one of his most popular songs. It was called, I Sing the Songs. I want you to listen to the words. And this is almost like the words that Rolling Stones wrote in Sympathy for the Devil. Barry Manilow wrote in this song, I have been alive forever, and I wrote the very first song. Isn't it funny? The Bible mm. talks about Lucifer in Ezekiel chapter 28, 
It talks about his cords, his pipes being perfect in him the day that he was created. Many Bible scholars believe from the text in the scripture, in the original text, that Lucifer was the leader of the angelic host in singing. He knows music. He understands how to use even his own voice to hypnotize an audience. So Barry Manilow says, I've been alive forever, and I wrote the very first song. I put the words and the melodies together. I am music, and I write the songs. I write the songs that make the whole world sing. I write the songs of love and special things. I write the songs that make the young girls cry. I write the songs. I write the songs. And this is the part that gets scary. My home lies deep within you, and I've got my own place in your soul. Whoa. Now when I look out through your eyes, I'm young again, even though I'm very old. This is talking about the demon that's inside of him. Little Barry out. Manilow did that. Yes. <laughs> then he says, oh, my music makes you dance and gives you spirit to take a chance. And I wrote some rock and roll so you can move. Music fills your heart. Well, that's a real fine place to start. It's from me. It's for you. It's from you. And it's for me. It's a worldwide symphony. I am music. I write the songs. Gosh, I've never even looked at those words. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> when we realize what's happening here, that through words, just like God dwells inside of his people through his word, Satan is gaining access to God's people through his word. That's why Jesus said, set no evil thing before your eye. Don't watch Hollywood movies. Don't watch and listen to secular music. The angels in heaven don't go, well, I'm just going to listen to some, it's not spiritual music, but I'm just going to listen to this stuff. It's just kind of medium. It's, it's neutral. There is no neutral. It's either for God or it's for the enemy. So, you know, for me, I don't want to give the enemy any right to my life in any way, shape, or form. Wow. Great information there, Eric, you're sharing with us today. It has to become real to us. I'll give you an example. If you turn with me in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, there's a, a promise here. Many people are probably like how you and I were. I knew what the right thing to do was, but my heart wanted to do the wrong thing. I knew what good food looked like, but my heart and my stomach and my mouth wanted the bad food. You wanted a pork sandwich, didn't you? <laughs> or I wanted a Coca-Cola. I mean, it's not good for you. They clean engines with Coca-Cola. There's nothing we, in Coca-Cola. We, we use Coca-Cola to clean the deck plates on the ship. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, and I'm not picking on people if they're if that's where they're at, but I'm saying my heart wanted to do what was wrong even though I knew it was wrong. So I would force myself to do the right thing, but the whole time I was wanting to do what was wrong. In Romans chapter 8, the Lord tells us what the problem was. I wish I'd known this 30 years ago. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. It says, Eric, it's this way because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means it hates God. It hates divinity. For the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. The reason... I was not subject to the law of God. I could force myself to do it on the outside, but inside I still wanted to do wrong. It was because I still had the carnal mind. I had not been born again. I had not claimed by faith God's promise, let this mind be in me, which was also in Jesus. The mind that was in Jesus was God the Father. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. The words I speak are not mine. They're his that he's speaking through me. So that's what I'm, I'm learning now. I've got to allow God to have, and Christ to have, the throne of my heart. Oh, I didn't realize how close we were to the end today. <laughs> wow, these things go fast. Anyway, we sure appreciate you being here today and all our audience. And 
we look forward to our next episode together and we hope everybody has a blessed day and amen good amen to see you, eric I look forward to seeing you again Otto, and all of our listening audience okay cool thank you we hope you were blessed by what you heard today remember we are looking for jesus second coming you can contact us by email, wfhcfm at gmail.com or call 828-692-1190. We welcome your questions or comments.